I think now it's time to go on to our panel discussion, um, which is all about influence and persuasion, which I think as if you've been here for the whole afternoon, you will have kind of picked that up as a theme, a really, really important theme in both the reducing carbon and the beyond carbon sessions. So we have a, a, a brilliant uh, panel group of panelists um, who have joined us today. Um, so we've got uh, we've got Nick Francis, um, who's a lecturer at University of Sheffield. We've got John Vigar, who's a consultant at Surrey County, County Council. Lauren Barnes, structural engineer and sustainability consultant at Arup, and Julia Barfield, founding director of Marks Barfield Architects. So, um, so what we're going to do in this session, uh, we've got about fifty minutes, um, and it's going to kind of be split up into three sections. In the first section, it's going to be it's going to be brief, where each of the panelists are going to introduce themselves and also um, answer the question. And I'm just gonna get the, the question up so I don't, <laughs> so I don't get it wrong. Um, the question is, what one thing should engineers do to be better influencers in the climate emergency? Um, try and answer that in one minute, one and a half minutes is, is just about okay. Um, and then we're gonna have about 25 minutes of structured questions uh, where we're gonna kind of talk about the influence um, and persuasion that we can have on our projects within the project team. And then we're gonna open it up to, to Q&A from the audience. So while you're listening to the discussion, please do type in questions um, into the, into the Q&A bar and upvote questions that you like so we can, we can make sure that we, we direct them correctly. Um, Fantastic. So um, if I can hand over firstly to Nick. Hello. Right. Hello, everybody. Yes. Uh, thank you. I'm Nick Francis. I teach civil engineering and management at the University of Sheffield. Uh, I'm director of education for the Get It Right Initiative, which is a construction industry body that drives behaviour change to prevent error. And I'm also a trustee of uh, Bridges to Prosperity UK Charitable Trust. Um, so that's an national NGO that focuses on constructing footbridges in the developing world to create connection and end rural isolation. Um, so the question of what one thing should engineers do to become better influences in the climate emergency? My answer to that is that we should always be teaching. And I say this because I think we need to avoid the curse of knowledge, which is the idea that we assume we assume that people have the background knowledge to really understand what we are telling them. Um, so whilst structural engineers are uniquely placed to understand the energy, the materials, the emissions uh, that are involved in creating structures, um, I'm not sure that we always communicate that properly and we get frustrated when people don't feel like they're not listening to us. Whereas if we can constantly drip feed a better understanding of what we do, then when we share this knowledge, it's more likely that people will be able to understand it and uh, do something positive with the information that we try and share with them. Brilliant. Thank you, Nick. Um, let's go next to Lauren. Hi, thanks, Orlando. Thanks, everyone, so much for the, the talk today. It's been really, really inspiring. So, uh, yeah, I'm Lauren Barnes. I am a building structures engineer and sustainability consultant at Arup in the Sheffield office. Um, I've worked for about five years now on a range of different projects. Um, like lots of people on this call, I was drawn to the industry to kind of try and shape a better world for play people. Um, and probably... Um, I will be around, I won't even be mid-career by the time we get to our seven years time for our carbon budget. Um, by the time we have to hit net zero for 2050, I might be 20 years away from retiring. So this is something that I am incredibly inspired to be as a structural engineer, to be addressing this and thinking about the climate emergency, because it will be something that's very prevalent throughout my career over the next, uh, however long I'm lucky enough to work as a structural engineer. Um, but I've also been splitting my time as a sustainability consultant. So being able to think about this as a holistic um, collaborative approach to how we tackle this. So the one thing that I think we need to be able to do to influence and persuade um, in our industry is to, to go back to what Tanya said about really thinking about what drives us. Um, what are the individual things that we care about? Um, who are the people we encounter? What are the things that we think we have influence over ourselves? 
So what things are we passionate about? Um, I'm lucky enough to work with people who are super passionate about low carbon design, regenerative design, sustainable finance. Um, and it's very hard not to be inspired and be influenced when you listen to people speaking about what really drives them, what really influence, in, in, impacts them. So I think for me, it's about thinking about what are those core drivers for your own individual lives and then letting that shine out throughout your work. Love it. Thanks, Lauren. Um, and Julia, on to you, please. So, hello. Yes, it's, it has been an inspirational afternoon, actually. Really fantastic speakers. Um, so, Julia Barfield, I'm founding director of Marks Barfield Architects, along with my, um, my partner, David Marks. And um, we're probably best known as the creative um, entrepreneurs behind the London Eye and the Brighton Eye 360. And we've always tried to work in close partnership with engineers and and try to design sustainably. But all that changed in 2018 with the IPCC report, and it became clear that we're on the brink of a climate emergency. And that prompted me to help set up Architects Declare in May 2019. And in our practice, we're moving beyond sustainability to a more regenerative mindset and practice. I mean, in answer to the question of what engineers can do, I mean, I think like architects, engineers are really are problem solvers and so can potentially be very good influencers. And for me, um, what, what I found is, is most, um, most effective is just to see the world through the lens of a climate emergency. I mean, it could be top of mind all the time and it needs to guide all, all our choices, both professional, personal and political. Um, and you know, if if people have that mindset and educate themselves to know the urgency and 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 really allow it to to guide all the choices, then with that mindset, then I think we can be quite influential. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Julia. Um, and on to John. Hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm uh, John Vigar. I am a general practice charter surveyor. Um, I've been a, uh, involved with development projects as a client through most of my working life. Um, I run my own development company, have done for the last 20 years, and I'm also a consultant to, at the moment, Surrey County Council, and I'm working on um, a range of development projects for them, including their li library portfolio, and in the recent past on some children's homes projects. So quite a diverse range of projects, which are very interesting. Um, uh, uh, in answer to the question, I think, I believe very strongly that there's a strong onus on the client to create the uh, an open and honest environment within a professional team. And that can have a big influence on a project on how on how that's managed. And I think, I think a challenge to, to team members is to risk being heard to to put yourself out there um, be proactive with your communication i think we're all on a very steep learning curve in in so many <laughs> issues in the in the built environment at the moment and the levels of knowledge are, are vastly different between people so put yourself out there share your knowledge and, and take the risk to to speak to your client and to other members of the professional team um, to take these projects forward in the right way Thanks, John. Wow, those are some yeah amazing, amazing answers covering um, teaching, continuously teaching, letting your core drivers shine through, um, educating ourselves and letting the climate emergency drive us and um, be being proactive with your communication um, and risk being heard. So so I think I think if, it would be great if we could kind of bring bring those thoughts um, and really think about and I think that they will lend themselves to really, really well thinking about what our influence within the project team as we think about sort of outside the project team at, at a wider scale, but really thinking within the project team, how we influence um, designs and, and what's actually being built. Um, so I, I guess, Nick, it would, be, it would be great if we could go to you first on kind of trying to dig into a bit more on, on your on your ideas about teaching and, and think about what behaviours and skills um, engineers um, need to, posit to to make that positive influence um, sort of through their teaching kind of what, what kind of mindset do they have to um, do we need to adopt um, to, to really to really do that so I think as structural engineers we are 
in a comfortable position in that we are often the experts in the room and we can retreat behind that when we say, well, no, this is how it needs to be. And I think maybe less confident engineers can hide behind that. They like being not being questioned. And actually, what I think we need to do is take off that armour that protects us from being questioned and get into the habit of, of basically sharing our working. No, not, not, I'm not talking numbers here, but explaining all the time. And it's a bit like making ourselves vulnerable and showing people what, why we think something. And if we can get into the habit of that, we, we start to have those connections and we start to build up the trust. And I think also when we tell someone, no, the beam has to be this size, people accept it. But when we say, no, you shouldn't use the concrete option. You should look at the, you know, the repurposing of this option. People don't accept it because it doesn't come out of a code and we, we haven't got the moral authority to just say that. So we need to have a different type of conversation. And that is a conversation based on actually taking people on a journey with us. And we need to start that earlier. We can't start having that conversation at the point at which we're trying to convince someone to do something that doesn't intuitively make sense to them. We have to do it in everything we do is, is you know, stop hiding behind our position of assumed expertise. Yeah. And, and Julia, would you would you agree with that kind of the idea of engineers having that armour that they're wearing and thinking and thinking they're right and, and, and that potentially affecting how much influence they have? Yeah, but, I, but I, I think that it's, I mean, collaboration is so important among the design team. You know, I think it's, um, you know, architects and engineers need to work together um, and, and, you know, possibly establish common goals at the beginning. Um, you know, I think asking those awkward questions, I mean, you know, this whole um, afternoon has been termed, you know, about the climate emergency, but often, you know, and language matters. And I think that's really good. But often people talk about climate change, you know, and I know when people start talking about climate change that they really don't get it. You know, I think, you know, you've got to, we've got to have, have asked those questions right at the beginning and, you know, establish what, um, what are the criteria behind what we're doing. And, and it, it, you know, there is persuasion for the client too, but I, I, I take what was said earlier in the conference that actually a lot of funders now are leading the way so it's kind of coming from the top down and and the bottom up which is really good um, so I think there's real opportunity um, as long as we challenge ourselves as teams and it has to be a team effort I think um, to to really kind of push as far as we can go because it's necessary if I, if I can add on as well I think um, I said today's conference as well as anything we as structural engineers need to have a little bit of ecology knowledge we need to have sustainable finance knowledge we need to be a material scientist we might need to you know we need to have all these different strings to our bow and so I think we need to be professionally vulnerable as well and ask um you said this um can you explain it further to me so that I can then make the informed choice for my structural engineering as well so as much as we need to be prepared to answer and defend our questions we need to be um ready to ask those questions back and be ready to be learn and evolve in our thinking as well because yeah like you said Nick we're, we're often coming in as the experts but we, we need to be in a position to be able to kind of become that trusted partner that we're we're working together and that might involve us being like I don't think I understand fully how we're going to achieve the bio, biodiversity net gain in this project can you help can you help me understand it more so I can um you know help us get to that outcome I've, I've just had a recent live uh, live experience where um, we're working through a, a, a project at Surrey and, and we're setting ourselves up to go up for cabinet approval for quite a, a large project in what is a very difficult environment. And actually the professional team, as a team, put their hands up reasonably late in the day, but in the way Nick just explained it, it for very good reason, we're able to explain why we needed to do more work and delay the process because we were going to be going up to cabinet without the full picture. And and I, I, whilst it was it was a, a blow, I was I was really pleased that the team felt comfortable enough to have communicated amongst themselves and then stepped up to say, look, for these reasons, we feel that we need to take more time and do more work to enable <coughs> to make a better decision. Uh, you know, for me, that's I can support that all day long um, in terms of a process. 
Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And, and so, so how do you how do you foster that in a team, John? Um, I, I, I suppose my my experience. I, I think it comes down to character a lot. It comes down to it comes down to financial pressures, where you are in the process. There's lots and lots of factors, aren't there, that go into making how how teams function. But I think. For me as a client, I try, I try, I try to be very open. I try to be, um, I try to get to know the people that I'm working with. Um, I, I'm very keen that everybody in the process is feels able to talk from from the most junior structural engineer to the most senior. And I and I've and I've questioned the leaders of teams to say, well, what, where does this person fit into your communication process? before you feed back to me are they have they got a voice at your table because they seem to be sitting at every meeting and not saying anything and I don't want that so so I feel I, I, I feel you you sort of have to set the scene early on and then back up back up what you're saying and doing but it's not easy because you know equally there are huge budget and time pressures but I think if you can make that process work better you will get a better project and, mm -hmm. and hopefully a better design better finished. And, and cheaper product yeah and, and julia how how rare do you think it is to to have a client like that and uh and, and how how can you overcome it when they're not like that well yes obviously it's very difficult to overcome it when they're not like that um i suppose we you know it comes back to um trying to choose the clients that you want to work with where you can i mean i don't know you can't always do that um, and, you know, I remember, um, yeah, it was, um, you know, there was one thing that, uh, that one of the senior people at Arax used to say is that the first thing the architect or the engineer wants to do is redesign the client. But uh, obviously you can't do that. Um, no, I mean, it, again, it comes to persuasion. Um, and it also comes to with, you know, knowledge, you know, background knowledge, so that you can actually show that you, you know, that you're serious about this. I mean, what we tend to do now is all, in all our appointment letters, we say that we're going to, we're, we're abiding by the, the RIBA 2030 challenge. I mean, that's, you know, part of you know what we do um and so you know if there's any client that's actually not interested in that then you know maybe they'll just kind of choose somebody else which you know may be a bad thing but <laughs> actually we don't want to work with people who who don't but I, as i say what we're finding is that the the funders are really influencing from the top um as well as us influencing from the bottom so you know there is a possibility of of real change but um us as the design team we need to uh, take it really seriously and um, you know question when um, clients try to do you know too much offsetting which I you know think is a bit of a cheat personally but um, you know that needs to be real it needs to be real the, um, the carbon um, calculations. Mm. And, and Nick do you, do you have any Thought, thoughts so, on that as well with your um <laughs> go, go for it go for it <laughs> so yeah I was, I, was, I was just really agreeing strongly with what lauren was saying um about the fact that we need to actually listen to other people and i thought it's funny that implicit in this question that's written by structural engineers talking about structural engineers is how do we influence other people so the implicit thing there is we know what to do we know the answer we need everyone else to do what we tell them and I think we need to look at that assumption and recognise it and say that there is there are two halves to this influence. It's be it's allowing ourselves to be influenced and then having influence on others in a positive way. And there's just as much work goes into the allowing ourselves to be influenced and listen as needs to go into the having influence on others. Um, and on that being influenced, I think it's an interesting question. And it's sort of what John was picking up on of. Um, can we always ask ourselves who's not at this table? You know, every meeting we go to, we will we will go into that meeting thinking about the thing that is our job to think about. But actually, can we just stop ourselves and go, who isn't at this table? Who, what, you know, who, what isn't represented here? And can we try and be a gateway to make sure that they are represented? And also, even if they are there, who's not being listened to? 
because you know as a structural engineer if i'm sitting there with um someone who's you know represents ecology i know that i probably get listened to more than other people at that table there is an unspoken hierarchy you know someone who's in charge of the budget probably gets listened to most and actually can i use my influence to support the people who aren't being listened to and so i'd say those are two two priority areas really um you know allow ourselves to be in well three allow ourselves to be influenced spot who isn't at the table and support those people who aren't being listened to and and none of that is us knowing the answer and telling other people what it is no that's 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 really useful and, and lauren how, how does that how does that feel as kind of as an engineer on the on the on the younger scale or um to, to hear that and uh and and how how should we develop our young engineers to kind of take take hold of that opportunity when it's presented yeah i think it's a, it's a really good point and i think it goes beyond the design team meeting it goes about a company culture and it's about a a, a team dynamics internal um most junior engineers might not get to go to the first client meeting. We, we've talked a lot today about those zero to one decisions. You might not get taken to them in your first week. You might do, but you might not. So actually, how can you, how can your team and your office and your company be enabling you to have that voice from the offset? And that goes to a much wider culture question. It's about a much wider diversity and inclusion point, really. You should be being enabled and empowered to ask those questions to to be taught to be to be challenged and to challenge and um, because then it becomes much more normal when you go to a client and ask it's much more scary if i'm sat opposite john as my client to then be like i don't think you're right but if i'm used to actually doing that and then articulating it a different way using my language i'm, I'm seeing it being modeled by my seniors in the office i'm seeing how that looks like around the biscuit charrette in in the office that's much more easier than to kind of translate into a a high profile client conversation um it, it's too much to expect junior engineers to be able to to do that first you know without any practice so i think i would encourage everyone on the call to think about how can they do that in their in their day-to-day -day jobs how can they be taught you know turn to that person next to them and saying well how's that design decision in you know addressing the climate emergency and having a little chat about it because they're going to be much better at then going into that design meeting or that bid writing to be able to do it and we can't expect suddenly you get chartered you hit senior engineer and we all have these skills ready to go um so i think it's that enabling empowering and modeling it from day one i think it's so important and i think i think you know as structural engineers you train as structural engineers but there's so much more to life and business and that and 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 how you interact with people and that we've all been challenged by having to do a lot of our interact interacting across these sorts of um through computers rather than around the table and that is really that's much harder again so um i think there's a there's a huge bit about training people how to how to communicate better and how to influence and how to work within a team not just about your structural engineering skill set be because you, you know you almost have to take that as red and, and the other thing i think as well is that this is such a fast moving situation and there's such a range of knowledge amongst people of all of all experiences and and skill sets and 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 positions that nothing's right nothing's wrong and we've got we've got to all talk and and learn together um and not be dictated to by someone who thinks they know it all because i'm pretty sure they don't <laughs> the industry's changing so quickly there's a new report out nearly every week i think at the moment my you know structural engineering to read and then my sustainability to read is, is growing and if you're given the opportunity to engineer that you can keep on top of part of it and say well there's a really good uk gbc report this week i think this is the highlight you should read senior engineer um that can add a lot of value and, and help open lots of doors i think is, is a bit of advice if you can keep even on a fraction of it that some of your senior engineers and directors might, might not be able to you're quickly lent across for that advice. I mean, we, we in the office, we have a climate action group, which is, you know, a lot of the kind of young people in the practice are very active in. And, you know, there's a lot of knowledge sharing through that. But also, you know, there's a huge amount of knowledge sharing now through things like Letty and ACAN and, and Architects Declare and Engineers Declare. And I think if we all, you know, we all need, it, it is difficult to keep up because, you know, the, the uh, we are needing to, um, 
you know, upscale so fast. Um, but I think there's lots of opportunity for young people to really get their voice heard within all of that network of, of, of groups. And they're really making powerful impact on, on, the, um, on the whole construction industry. Yeah, that, I mean, they, those are fantastic voice points and I really, and that really kind of hits the chord with me as well, um, Lauren. And, and I mean, and you mentioned this in our kind of pre, pre catch up before this, um, but ha yeah, how, how else could, could young engineers be really used because it's such a great resource, most of the people in the company are, are young, young engineers. How, how could they be, be used aside from kind of what you've just described? Um, I think one of the things that I found incredibly useful is is um, you might not have been asked yet. You might be you might have been given an, an output. Can you please design this beams or can you please look at this bit of the structure? And and I think what we've talked about today is the outcome thinking. So how can you if you've been asked to scheme something, could you also um, sneak in some carbon calcs? Um, could you you might have a bit of time to do the learning on the job um, if you if you you know you're doing something new? Can you also help present if you're doing some scheme options can you also include the the carbon calc because you've been able to pick up that skill using one of the tools that you know were shown earlier um i think there is the um finding your skill in that i think is always it's always going to be advised you might have that extra training budget um to maybe go out and do some of this stuff did i say something clever in before was the, were you... <laughs> no 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 that no that's that's perfect no yeah yeah, I, th right. I think I think there might be something interesting here that I, I tend to pick up when whenever we have these conversations about reducing CO2 emissions, reducing our damage, um, that there, it feels like there's a bit of a crisis of morale amongst the people who think about this stuff. And our dialogue is always about reducing the harm that we do. You know, 50, 100 years ago, the, the dialogue was about the benefit that we created. You know, the birth of civil engineering is about harnessing the forces of nature for the benefit of mankind. And our, our, our mantra now is try to do as little as you possibly can because everything you do is terrible. I mean, that's a, that's a fairly distressing message if that's what we're saying. Um, and actually, I think maybe we can try to make sure that we we boost that morale by also focusing on the benefit of our projects and at the same time celebrating how we can do it without causing damage but but we you know we need to be very careful that those of us who are maybe more passionate about the wider environmental concerns climate crisis biodiversity loss don't just think that we are all doing harm and it's all bad um i don't know what the other panelists think about that I really agree with that. I mean, because, you know, um, you know, there is a narrative that says, you know, environmentalists want us to go back to the dark ages and, you know, mm -hmm. but actually it, the, the truth is completely the reverse because, you know, a lot of the measures that we can make, particularly in cities, are actually going to make the quality of life better. You know, they, you know, with um, eventually car-free cities and, and active travel and, you know, lower pollution and, you know, they're all going to make for better quality of life, healthier population, um, you know, than, than, than we had before. So, yeah, I agree. You know, we do need to think about <laughs> that all of these measures that we can take are actually going to be very beneficial and hopefully in a social way as well and um, reduce inequality and certainly reduce fuel poverty and, uh, and all of that. I mean, that's the kind of impact we can have. Mm. And, and as engineers, we're well suited to, to be helping. You know, a lot of us uh, might feel like, well, what's our future of our jobs if we if we strongly believe that um, we sh should no longer be building? <laughs> how are we going to be? How which we, it, which is from what we can see today is is really what we should be saying, and we should say. Yeah. So where's my where's my job going to be in ten years time? But ultimately, actually, what we have is a really exciting skill set to be advising and and and, and being useful yeah. in this and shaping this. No, absolutely, in a broader way. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So that holistic and collaborative approach that we develop as engineers anyway will still be useful. It might look slightly different, but actually yeah. we, we have got the right skill set to be excited about it. So hopefully we can we can look forward to the kind of opportunities that the climate emergency might face versus the it's going to be really hard work and we're on a curve like this and we need to get on a curve like this, which can mm -hmm. feel quite um demoralizing sometimes. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's such a good point. And and we've got we've got a question coming through from the from the audience. Um, engineers have always been taught to give solutions based on physics and science, advocating for sustainability decisions without metrics or tested benchmarks is a change. What skills do engineers need to deal with this? And can we teach them this? John, I was wondering whether you wanted to, from your perspective, answer that question. I, I, I suppose I, I come back to something I said earlier, really. I do, I do feel there's wider training than just the, just the engineering training that's needed to be a professional in this environment we find ourselves. You need to be a very good communicator. You need to be able um, um, to, to, to see the wider picture. Um, you need to understand how to work in teams. Um, and, you need, and you know, and you need to understand how to work with a client. And I think, I think those are sort of soft skills that are really vital to, for everybody, not just in the structural engineer business. Throughout, I, I, you know, we, we're we're facing some really challenging choices and and ways of working together, and we've got to be well armed to make sure we do those as well as we can. I, I, I'd actually um, sort of challenge that assumption that we need to teach those skills. And I'd say what we need to do is stop unteaching them. Because if you send a bunch of kids into the woods and ask them to build a small bridge across a stream, they'll work out how to do it and they will take into account myriad factors. And, and humans are brilliant at this. And I wonder if through our education, professional institutions, our codes of practice, maybe we train people to think of themselves in a box. My responsibility is to think about the physics, think about the materials, follow the design code and answer this bounded question. And actually, when people start becoming engineers, they don't think like that. So, so I'd say that we need to be careful that we don't educate that skill out of people rather than educating the skill into them, which I don't know if that's too nuanced and subtle and nonsense, but I don't know what anyone else anyone else thinks of that I, I i totally agree i have a, i have a one and a half year old and i can i can totally see that see that being the case of just kind of not not wanting to kind of preserve that that creativity as much as possible um i think that's a fantastic point um and we have another question from the from the q a panel uh what should a structural engineer do if they're part of a team that has not been set up with collaboration in mind. Um, Lauren, do you wanna? Uh, yeah, it's a very difficult question because uh, I don't think I can tell you to leave a job and find a team that is collaborative. Um, mm -hmm. I think um, my advice would be model what you want to see. Um, you're, you're never too junior, you're never too, um, never too junior, never too in a role to, um, to change, to change culture and um, mirror what you'd like to see and um, ask for feedback, be open to feedback and um, ask for design reviews. If you don't think you're getting them enough. Um, ultimately someone has some risk, risk and responsibility around you. If they don't think you've been collaborative, they're not performing to their job level. I would say um, if your managers aren't demonstrating that they are, they're failing you as a, as as a as a you know as a member of staff so i think it's never to you're never in the wrong role to model that ask for that help if you don't think um you don't think you're getting the right level of collaboration um be the first one to say um it's a thursday afternoon it's raining let's can we all stand up and talk about this design problem or um i'd love someone to go through my analysis model or what does everybody think about the ice truck tea climate emergency um seminar last week it's hard work, but it, it, it will yeah. hopefully inspire other people around you because I'm sure you're not the only person that's feeling like that. Yeah, that risk of being heard, isn't it? It's that risk of putting your hand up and behaving in, in the way you've described really well is, is not easy to do, but it, it just, it does, other people do feed off it. And those that don't, perhaps some people you're never going to change, but as you say, perhaps they're not people you choose to work with all the time. And you do have choice about, about things, you, you know, you can empower yourself to make those choices. Mm. Yeah, I think think something that's also worth, you know, it's sometimes difficult to see, but maybe worth trying to hang on to in those really difficult situations is that um, <coughs> you never have as much influence as you hope, but you normally do have more influence than you realise. Mm. 
Mm. And, mm. Um, you know, take take the little wins, <laughs> I think is the, you know, take the little wins, keep your own morale up and do the best you can. And if you need to move on, but, um, you know, yeah, just take the little wins. Yeah, no, I, that's, I love that idea. Um, another uh, point from the, the Q&A, um, well, building on a couple of points, thanks to, thanks to Will, uh, is there an opportunity here for industry and academia to work together to create engineers that are unconstrained advocates for change? Um, Nick, I wonder if you want to answer that building on your, on your last point of not um, teaching. I think there's, I think there's an incredible opportunity. I think there are many practical reasons that make that very challenging. Mm. Um, I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, I think I think we're on the yeah. May, maybe it needs a bit of a zeitgeist change. Zeitgeist change if we are going to have a have an overall change in the perspective of what engineers role is how they should be educated i mean the so the joint board of moderators um puts together the criteria that are the skills that engineers need and that is driven by industry um but inevitably with anything like that it's always going to be retrospective it's you know this is what we have needed and therefore this is what we still need or this is what we think we need next mm. week um and i think we're actually talking about longer term so there is a i think there's almost a moral question about who who owns those decisions do do the universities respond to what industry say they want do does somebody else say this is what we think is morally important that engineers do and who does that um you know i think we we touch on it in organizations like this um so i think it's a very good question and i don't really have a short I mean, clever answer what one of the questions that we've been discussing in architects to claire is is about you know what is our mission um and you know doctors have a hippocratic oath you know and you know that there, there's a clear set of you know ethical values um and um you know we don't really have that as architects i'm not quite you know maybe maybe the i structure does I'm not sure what that the mission is, but you know, it, uh, I think we do need to start to kind of go back to first principles and, you know, why are we doing what we're doing, and um, you know, who's who do we, you know, who who where is our responsibility to? Is it uh, you know principally to the client or is it to society and to the planet? You know, I mean, you know, I think that they are kind of fairly fundamental questions that. Um, that we need to relook at, and we've been we've been encouraging the RIBA to look at the mission and um, and uh, relook at the mission and you know establish one that's fit for um, you know 2022 because it's not the same as the, what was written in whenever it was. Um, one of the skills that I'd written down for the first one was the ability to think about the relationship about what we do today and what it might have an impact in the future. And I think as an industry, I think someone mentioned earlier, we're probably one of the only industries that builds a product and walks away and doesn't necessarily yeah. sometimes think about how our buildings are used. And I think we probably need to get better at that kind of multi-stakeholder thinking about post-occupancy. Um, what, are, what are the impacts of a building that I designed this morning to that 2050 target or the 2030 target? Um, that response, we have actually quite a big responsibility. <laughs> And we probably don't give ourselves enough credit for what we're doing, and we probably don't demand that. I think we're quite um, humble as a pra as a as an industry to think, oh no, we're just we're just doing building design. But actually, we've got a huge responsibility, and we we can we can do quite a lot of bad stuff sometimes. So like, we need to be ready for that responsibility and kind of hold ourselves. I think that's quite a good idea to have some kind of oath that I promise that I'm not going to do my best. Yeah. Yeah, to totally. And, and John, do you, I mean, in terms of uh, the point that Lauren's just made, um, how, how do you see, from your perspective, that kind of post-occupancy influence coming into effect? That's, I, I, 
that's too difficult for me to answer. I just wanted to pick up something else, if you don't mind. I just, sure. I, I, I just, <laughs> right. I was just, um, I was just thinking and listening to Laura and thinking that actually, what a lot of what this is about is that each of us looking at and, and what Nick was saying, looking at ourselves as individuals and how how do we want to behave and who do we want to be and how do we want to influence the world in front of us and, and moving forward and and it's a bit sort of wishy washy, but actually make, make you know making your trying to get clear ideas of who you are or who you want to be and then how you're going to get there and sort of perhaps put some other training around yourself um around your structural engineering around communication around so so that you're you're creating your own your own little business as yourself um is perhaps a different way of looking at it and that and that fear of you know being a humble structural engineer it doesn't have to be like that because you do have a big influence and having that confidence in in who you are and what you do as individuals, I think is absolutely vital in, in in creating those workplaces that function really well. So it's on it's in you know it's in everybody's interest if 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 we're all trying to do that. And it's a bit wishy washy, and it's a bit go and get counselling. But it's a bit no, if we're all if we're all you know thinking about these things and training ourselves in better ways, then that's good for everybody. I think. Yeah, so is that wishy washy and a bit? Mm. Weird. No, not not at all. I, I mean, I, it's, it's what Tanya talked about in her talk earlier as well. She sort of came up with that framework for assessing her her impact. And yeah, I thought that was a fantastic, fantastic way to look at it. But yeah, I'll yeah the ripple effect. This. I think I think that was that was really good um, because I think that you know we are most influential really when we um, kind of show by example, as opposed to you know you can't tell people what to do, but if you kind of say well I'm doing this you know I've decided not to fly or you know whatever um you know that's just kind of offering an influence and then you know people will um maybe be influenced by it or not but um yeah yeah and I'm if I may I'll bring it, bring it back to something that was mentioned earlier um around who who we should bring to the table I think I think it's a really really important point um and kind of links into that idea of kind of looking outwards from ourselves on, on how we could be influenced by by someone different. Um, what what kind of people are, are generally missing from the table that we think we could bring in? Um, John, I guess it's it varies for every project, but from yeah. from your your experience. Well, again, I think this is part of the sort of really steep learning curve that I'm in, and I, I think we probably all are about about sustainability and carbon and and um and the performance of buildings moving forward and i i just i i've just i've just had people introduced into teams really recently that i didn't even know exist and really didn't know what they were doing and that's a lot of that is around around benchmarking carbon performance in a building and then setting um your you know your targets and then how that all influences into the into the professional team and the and the specification and I, and I'm I, you know this is probably something you're all very afraid with but for me it's something completely new so that that sort of real technical um, carbon um, surveying and reporting has become quite a big influence in a lot of the projects that I'm working on. Yeah. Julia, do you, do you have any thoughts on that question? As well, well, I mean, there's also, you know, the whole well-being agenda, you know, that, uh, I mean, we've certainly, you know, biophilic design and well-being agenda, and we've certainly got, um, you know, very much into, into all of that, um, trying to, you know, in design an office, actually design an office that people really want to go to and that lifts their spirits when they walk into it. I mean, you know, it's not hard. I mean, I don't think that, you know, brings elements of nature in and, you um, you know those are all the things that we can we can we can think about and um that's somebody else who could be at the table i suppose i think i think the identifying a list of the people who should be at the table is is probably near impossible because it's a it's, a, it's an unknown unknown we don't know what we don't know um a framework that i find quite useful is um from kate rayworth in the donut economics sort of lab where they talk about local people local place global people and global place and so that gives you sort of four a checklist of four things to consider you know mm -hmm. and it gives you a starting point but i wonder if when we're talking about the world of construction you can maybe look at that with a time element as well and you can think about during construction 
during the service life of the thing and the distant future, maybe in seven generations time. And so if you wanted to have a checklist of what am I considering, you can consider those local people, local place, global people, global place, and think during construction, during the service life of this thing in the long-term future. And I don't know who the people are, but if some or one or some of those are being ignored, then that should set a warning siren off that you're not thinking about something you should be. Mm. Yeah, that's really good. So yes, the person seven generations in the future can't be at the table, but actually, you know, you do need to think about it from their point of view, from that point of view. Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely right. Yeah, and no, that's great. And Julia, we've got another question in the chat for you. Um, you described yourself as one of the entrepreneurs behind the London Eye. Are there entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial skills you learned from that process that are relevant to making a case for net zero solutions? Um, I think possibly, I mean, you know, getting, persuading people that um, a, you know, rather large wheel should be built in the middle of London did, you know, take a lot of uh, consultation. And, um, and I suppose that that was, we did learn a lot from that because, I mean, basically David and I just went to speak to anyone who would listen to us um, around, you know, in the London um, um, planning and diaspora community. And, um, you know, I think, I think that's talking to people, you know, face to face and, you know, describing it personally, um, I think had a lot of um, effect, you know, on, you know, whether it was the Royal Society of Arts or the, or the um, London Society or, you know, whoever it was, you know, we, I think it's just one-to-one -one consultation and, you know, persuasion. And we always made sure that we anticipated the questions we were going to get and were prepared to answer them even before they answer them hopefully <laughs> that's that I can only that, that's the only thing I can think of really yeah sort of amazing dedication and, and commitment to um and really allowing someone to understand that you what what your intentions are yeah um, and listening I mean I think and the listening. point about listening is also really important because I think a lot of consultation these days has become you know a bit tip box and um and and not is not real whereas you know i think you know we really did try and you know alter what we were doing depending on what people said particularly local community groups yeah thanks right. go on Lauren. i was gonna say it kind of goes back to that previous question about innovation or who you can bring around the table and the different people doing different things and community engagement specialists um people who are in an edi edi and i space as well who you know doing that thinking it doesn't mean that you're exempt from doing that it's not just like that's their problem um i don't need to think about it we've got a edi person on the team it's, it's how can you embody that into your into mm. your work as well i think mm. just picking up on and i mean what julie is talking about there's tremendously impressive and it's in inspiring to hear about but um picking up on what julia mentioned about um being influenced i just wonder how many design meetings take place where nothing changes and I wonder if that might be an indication that this isn't a successful process. If you go in and several several meetings later, nothing has been changed and it's been steamrolled through. That might be a canary in the coal mine that this isn't a this isn't a regenerative process that is taking into account diverse opinions if nothing's mm. changing. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. Mm. There's a great book called The Diversity Gap, and it lists some um qualities of teams that aren't inclusive and it lists perfectionism sense of urgency individualism or quantity over quality and therefore that i think our uh, industry can quite quickly fall into sometimes and um, that those kind of behaviors don't tend to often lead to inclusive environments and i think as soon as you go into a meeting or you feel like your work's being driven by one of those four things there's a list of 13 that I think it's right to say actually you're not going to create a space for innovation or entrepreneurship or uh, get those different voices heard if you're driving a sense of urgency or an individualism or quantity over quality. Now they're challenges. They're challenges to our industry and how we 
how we've been although of course there is a and... about the climate crisis true. <laughs> 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 And we, we have one more question that's uh, that's popular in the, in the Q&A chat. So it's, do, do we just need to wait for legislation to recognise that we have an environmental res responsibility on the same level as health and safety? <laughs> uh, I, we can visually see all of your answers <laughs> to that. But yeah, who wants can, to go? Can I, can I jump in? Because otherwise I'm going to chew through the table. Um, so... There's a really interesting sort of um, psychological theory about how we develop morality. Uh, Lawrence Kohlberg developed it and he talked about three levels of moral development. And it starts off with um, what's called the uh, pre-conventional level. And that is that people and animals um, do things to seek reward and avoid punishment. And this is how three to five year olds behave. It's how dogs behave. And then there's the conventional level of moral reasoning, which is that we we behave as part of a group. We basically fit in with what is normal. And that is how most human beings behave most of the time. It's why teenagers brains start to melt because they're trying to work out what is normal. And and then there's the post conventional moral thinking, which is trying to define the rules and the morality that should frame how we behave. And that's really hard thinking. That's hard to do. And we can look back in history and see where these, this has happened. So if you think about slavery for many years, that was normal. It was acceptable. You weren't punished. So at a conventional and pre-conventional level, it was OK. But hard post-conventional thinking started being done by a few people. And that hard post-conventional thinking has to trickle down. And the, the rules, the laws, the punishments, they always come as a time lag. And I think people can take the choice to sit back and say, I'll do whatever I can get away with. But we have to sort of look at ourselves and go, well, you know, who is it that's going to step up and, you know, do, do the right thing? So anyway, I'll hand over. Well, someone we else's we don't have time for that time lag. And, and with slavery, even, even at the time, there were people who were saying, you know, this isn't right. So it's kind of, it was society as a whole. It was the group, the herd that were, yeah. Yeah. And, and I, th I think, I think that's, that's a fantastic place to finish what has been su such a, a, a pleasure of a conversation to be part of. Um, so thank, thank you all so much for that. Um, We've, we've run out of time and apologies to anyone on the call who, whose question we didn't get around to, but um, the questions that we've had were great. So thank you very much. And thanks once again to our amazing panelists, really, really interesting and um, amazing thoughts there.